Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you so much for joining the broadcast this morning. Before we get started, I just want to cover a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, so hopefully everyone who is hearing the broadcast is logged in to <clears throat> the ON24 portal. Uh, so you should have a screen uh, in the middle uh, with some slides and a few little widgets at the bottom of the console. Uh, so from left to right, those widgets are, first off, the help widget. So if you're having any technical difficulties during this presentation, uh, the widget will direct you to the Technical Support Center, uh, and you can get some help. Second one is the slides widget. So if for whatever reason you're not actually uh, seeing a screen with some slides on it in front of you, hit that to bring them up. Uh, you can also resize the display if you need to just by clicking and dragging on the corner of that box. Next up is the resources widget. This just has a couple helpful links to some additional content. Um, both from ourselves at LOB as well as our friends at ARCA. So uh, if you're interested in learning some more, uh, you can dig in there and get a little more detail. Uh, and then lastly, the uh, questions widget, which is actually, I think, the most important. Uh, so our intention here is for this to be an interactive session. So if at any point you have any questions, anything that seems interesting, anything you want to learn more about, just pull that up and enter in your question into the Q&A widget. Uh, we've got some time saved at the end of the broadcast to cover as many of your questions as we can get to. Uh, so with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, for those who I haven't met before, uh, this is Michael Peach. Uh, I lead product marketing here at LOB. Uh, I'm really excited to be joined today by Phil Exar, who is the president and C or the founder and CEO of ARCA. Today we're going we're gonna to cover a couple different topics. We're going to spend uh, a little bit of time digging into the e-commerce landscape. Uh, I think as all of you know who are um, on the line and signed up for this webinar, uh, e-commerce and, and certainly retail as well can be a very competitive and challenging business. So we'll spend a little bit of time discussing the importance of differentiation and how e-commerce companies can really um, take some actions to stand out from their competitors. We'll share some best practices around branding, as well as personalizing your customer experiences and some practical examples that you can hopefully take home and use today. Uh, and as I said earlier, we'll, we'll take some time at the end of this broadcast for uh, any of your questions. So as we go along, anything that you want some clarity on or if you have any questions, make sure to drop those into the Q&A widget. So before we dig into all of that, I want to start with just a little bit of background um, about both uh, companies that are presenting today, uh, LOB and ARCA. So I'll talk just uh, very briefly about LOB. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, we're a software company that provides uh, a number of solutions for uh, retail and e-commerce companies. Uh, one is, is an address verification service that allows companies to check and correct address information um, prior to sending any shipments or mail to customers to, to ensure that um, the address that's been provided is a correct uh, and deliverable location. Uh, second service that we provide is an automated direct mail service. It allows companies to send targeted direct mail communications to their customers really in the same way that they communicate with their customers over email. Uh, both solutions are delivered as APIs which allows companies to fully integrate these capabilities within their e-commerce platform, CRM, email, or marketing automation. So now uh, let me hand over to Phil. And first off, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And tell us a little bit about ARCA. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, guys, first of all. Uh, to everyone attending, uh, appreciate you coming in to listen to what we have to say. Uh, ARCA is a platform for businesses to uh, source packaging online. So if you ship physical product, chances are you're not slapping a label on it and tossing it in the mail. It's going to go in some sort of package. And with Arca, we allow you to uh, select and design packaging in just a few clicks, which with as few as 10 boxes that you can get fully branded to reflect uh, your company's design. Okay. 
moving forward. Cool. Um, so on slide four. Awesome. Uh, so when you look at the e-commerce landscape here, uh, you'll see that you know Amazon's the dominant player, and then you also have the usual suspects of eBay and Walmart. Um, your storefront, however, on the other side will be of the 1.2 million companies that are going to be set aside from what you see in the typical e-commerce landscape. Um, how you want to differentiate yourself, we can get into shortly. Next slide. Um, so companies that can't differentiate will get lost. Uh, only 30% of millennials say they feel loyal to specific brands. Um, four years is the average lifespan of a small to mid-sized real retailer. Um, so we're essentially embarking on an economy that is less so on the broad scale and more so personalized for each person that's going to be um, you know, actually purchasing that product. Therefore, you're going to have to break away from all the noise to be able to have your company, your brand, your business shine amongst all the other big players out there. There's two ways to differentiate, uh, service and personalization. So to be able to curate an experience that provides delight at unexpected moments in the customer journey. What does that mean? So that doesn't necessarily just mean that uh, you know, you, you know, you're know you always answering the phone or you're always responding to emails in a timely fashion. It's also just creating something different that, that can allow your customers to experience um, something that reminds them of what it's like to work with your company. 80% uh, of consumers grow to love a brand over time, requiring three or more purchases to create that loyalty. Uh, and then it's on you to be able to create that re that retention, since that's the most important thing about growth for your business. Then there's personalization. So leveraging data to tailor experiences to customer preferences and expectations. Again, 80% of consumers prefer companies that personalize experiences. Nobody wants to just go in and buy something that everyone else can get anymore when they can you know, subscribe to a business that truly creates something for them. Next slide. On to you guys. Yep. Yeah. No, thanks for that. So, um, you know, knowing what it takes to, to differentiate and the, this idea of experiences and personalization, um, you know, that generally begs kind of the next question of, well, you know, how do you get there? And, you know, I think there are a couple of important things you want to think through as part of the strategy. And, you know, first and, and foremost, um, and what's really probably the most critical is the need for data, right? So any attempt to create a, a high-quality, personalized customer interaction is going to require at, at some level for you to put customer data to work. I think the good news is, for, for most of the folks on the line, is you, you probably already have most of the information that you need. So, you know, think about, think about your storefront, right, whether it's, it's Weebly or, or BigCommerce or Shopify or, or some other e-commerce platform. Um, you've probably got a bunch of transactional and demographic data about your customers in place within those systems, right? You know who they are. You know what types of things they've purchased. You know how frequently they purchased. Um, this is the type of information that you want to be able to pull in and start to fully leverage in the types of interactions that you build. Um, really, secondly to that is to think through where you're having those interactions, right? Most e-commerce companies are, are somewhat naturally digitally focused. Uh, your transactions are all digital. Probably a lot of your customer acquisition motions are digital. And frankly, a lot of your customer communications um, are digital, and I'm guessing probably pretty specifically grounded in, uh, in the realm of email. And there's, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing, nothing wrong with communicating with customers digitally. Um, but even if you're a pure e-commerce company who doesn't actually have a retail presence or a retail location, that doesn't mean that you can't activate offline channels um, and create engagements in offline channels for your customers, right? You think about sort of uh, the way that you do marketing, the way that you do order fulfillment, um, there's a lot of opportunities to sort of extend those interactions into the physical world um, to engage customers, well, at home, frankly, um, or at work, uh, or in places just sort of in addition to digital, uh, digital engagement. 
Um, and then lastly, you know, let's not underestimate the impact of branding, right? Your brand is more than just the product that you sell. It's more than just the appearance of your storefront. You know, it's really the, the cumulative total of all the interactions that you have with your customers across the customer journey. And, and really effective and differentiated e-commerce companies know, have a very clear sense of what their brand promise should be. Um, and they really carefully align that promise to their target customers. Uh, and what that means is they're thoughtful about how the brand shows up in each phase of the customer journey, right? So what does it look like on the front end when I'm doing customer acquisition? What does it look like when customers are engaged with my storefront, when they're doing shopping? Um, what does it look like when I fulfill an order? And what does it look like when I'm driving those follow-up campaigns to complete the repeat purchases that Phil was talking about earlier? So interestingly enough, uh, when we look at data and knowing that there's lots of data that we can leverage to um, optimize the customer experience, um, you know, there's a certain amount of basic data as well that sometimes gets lost. And, and certainly in the e-commerce world, um, one of those very basic but critical pieces of data is, is address data. Uh, so just a couple <laughs> quick notes on this. Uh, undeliverable mail and packages in the U.S. cost $20 billion per year. Um, and the thing that's kind of scary is almost all of that is wrapped up in very simple address errors. Um, so probably everyone who's dialing in has customers entering address information online. Um, well, generally up to about 20% of that is going to contain mistakes. People don't address, people don't add, um, people don't enter address information correctly all the time. Often they're in a hurry. Uh, they're checking out, they mistype something, they fat finger an address, uh, and those errors add up. And it doesn't take much for an address to go from being correct to being uh, incorrect to being utterly undeliverable. Uh, and for those of you who do business internationally, uh, this challenge is really compounded. Right? If you think about sort of the formatting requirements and different language requirements that uh, different addresses are written in, uh, it becomes very quickly to compound those errors and uh, have them lead to additional additional challenges. And so, yes, there's there's obviously dollars involved in poor address data, but it's not just about sort of shipping costs or extra shipping costs. That there's really an impact to the customer experience that comes with that as well, right? And it's potentially a really really significant impact. Um, so, you know, 94% of consumers will blame the, blame the retailer for a poor delivery experience. And I think probably the, the even more important component of that is even if the poor delivery experience is their fault, i.e., they entered an address incorrectly or didn't double-check the order before confirming it, it doesn't matter. They will still cast blame on the retailer. Uh, so your experience suffers even if the customer uh, or your your customer satisfaction um, suffers even if you're not at fault uh, for anything that goes wrong with the transaction. Uh, and even more challenging is 70% say they won't come back and purchase again. You really have one opportunity as an e-commerce company with your customers to create that sort of seamless order and fulfillment experience. And if you don't deliver on it, that customer's not coming back, right? And as we noted before, you need those multiple interactions. Brand loyalty is driven through repeat purchase. And without repeat purchase, you simply cannot build brand loyalty. So address data has another really important component to it as well, which is where we talk about sort of opening up the home to brand engagements uh, and as it relates to channel mix, right? So, um, you know, as an e-commerce company, if you want to engage customers offline, then you need the right information in order to reach them. I mean, we, we may not always think about it, but mail, physical mail, postal mail, is, is actually a really important channel for customer communications, uh, especially for, you know, pure e-commerce companies that maybe you don't have a storefront, you don't, or a physical storefront, you don't have a place where you can uh, extend that brand experience into the offline world. Um, well, mail at home is a really great way to do that. Um, 
you know, direct mail has, has been used a lot for customer acquisition, but more and more companies are, are now really embracing it as a part of, as a way to sort of engage customers throughout that customer life cycle, especially for retention campaigns. Um, and not even just retention campaigns, but also promoting act, uh, advocacy and, and even referral programs. There's a couple examples of um, direct mail for that that I've included on the slide here. Uh, the other thing is it can now be uh, much more deeply personalized. So uh, you can take sort of that customer preference data, whether it's products, whether it's messaging, um, and tailor the content on the direct mail that you're sending to align very closely with your target audience. Uh, and in the same way, it's possible now to really trigger that direct mail based on customer behavior or milestones, right? So in the same way, you've probably got a nurture flow set up or a campaign set up to do something if there's a certain interval between purchases for a customer. If you're looking to reactivate a customer who hasn't been to the storefront, uh, say, in a month or two months, uh, in the same way that you can trigger an email, it's now possible to trigger direct mail as a follow-up touch. And it's a, that's a really great way to um, get people to engage. So moving forward, um, you know, in some ways, bad address data is inevitable. You know, consumers, customers will make mistakes. Um, they will move. Um, buildings even change. So, you know, there's. It's important to sort of consider the fact that you're always going to have to do some planning for maintaining and, and cleaning addresses. Um, generally, the best approach that we've seen, uh, the companies are very successful at it. Do um, come at it sort of two ways. So one addressing address data on the front end. Uh, so making sure that at checkout time, uh, they're doing a quick ad address validation, checking for typos, making sure that they're entering an actual valid uh, postal delivery address, uh, and then correcting it at that point in time if needed. Uh, but then also just doing sort of regular ongoing cleanses. Uh, so taking the customer data, refreshing it, rinsing it, making it better. Um, and ensuring that the older data that's sitting in your systems uh, is continually getting updated and refreshed for the latest customer information. Um, so now, let me hand back over to Phil and we'll talk a little bit more about branding. Thank you. Yeah, so dot-com distribution put together some stats um, that reflected consumer behavior when it comes to purchasing um, and what branded packaging means to those consumers. So, um, you know, 40% of consumers were just apt to purchase a product uh, that came in a nice packaging versus the generic packaging that another product came in. And we've all been guilty of this, right? We're easily susceptible to judging a book by its cover. And when it comes to buying something, uh, you know, if you had two identical products, one came in a nice package, and if they're relatively priced the same, they they just went after something that was more premium. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the next uh, stat, which is the 68% of consumers uh, who just perceived the product as upscale because the package was premium. The packaging seemed upscale, and therefore the product gave off that same uh, uh, characteristic, which then converted that buyer to want to get that product. Um, you know, if you get something like a Rolex, in a plain brown box, you might be suspicious of it. And on the flip side, um, you know, there's a lot of drop shippers and and online merchants out there that might have, you know, just a fairly decent product uh, that anyone could really replicate through, you know, sourcing high volume through Alibaba uh, and then just getting a good marketing uh, campaign together, put it in a nice package, and then sell that. That's because branding and packaging had a lot to do with that. Um, the next statistic, 61% of consumers um, feeling a bout of excitement when it came to just receiving the package. And this is, again, something that we've all been uh, exposed to where um, at ARCA we call this the doorstep experience, right? So you come home and either in your lobby or, or your doorstep, um, wherever your mail is, uh, you get that sense of excitement because you see that box, that, that whether it's that Amazon box um, that everyone can recognize or the outside branding of that other business that you're working with. Um, 
that all ties back to that billboard, which is your box that works so hard for you and represents your brand. 44% said that the product was worth the cost because of the nice package that it arrived in. Uh, this is an interesting one because it mitigates buying remorse, uh, buyer's remorse. And when they purchased this product, uh, they were more likely to say, oh, well, it was worth it, all because that the branding and the patching, packaging experience was a memorable one. So with that, it is all about leaving a lasting impression. And with packaging, it's just an easy, it's just a simple investment. Um, it's the first physical interaction of, of your uh, store that the customer has. It's, it's almost like a physical form of like UI, UX experience uh, that someone receives when interacting with you and your brand. And it's a great tool for pushing clients to share their experience, right? Uh, whenever you see someone tag something or repost something or retweet something on Instagram that they purchased, it's typically alongside the packaging that it arrived in as well. So if you want your customers to continue to advocate your business and you want them to have something alongside that product to amplify that brand experience, then make sure you have a nice package that it arrives in as well. Um, you know, it has a huge effect on retention rates and, and brand advocacy for that reason. And, and again, going back to this being a good investment, um, in a world where the cost of your customer acquisition is going up again, retention, 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 um, this is an easy way to gather that. And this falls under the personalization category. Uh, when we looked at that slide earlier about personalization and service. And then just a quick run through of how easy it is to use our platform. Um, so, you know, step one, you pick a box type and size. Um, this is actually what it looks like on our site. Uh, you pick a material and quantity, you design your boxes and you check out. It's very easy. It's just as simple as designing and ordering a t-shirt online that you would want to get branded. Same thing goes for your store. And now I will let you guys talk about uh, a customer of yours. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so who's doing this well, uh, which is always a great place uh, to close out, is to share some examples of e-commerce companies that are branding and differentiating themselves uh, in unique ways. And, and certainly Smile Direct Club is an awesome example of this. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Smile Direct Club, they're, they're maybe a little bit under the radar uh, compared to other startup companies, but they are one of the absolutely fastest growing <clears throat> uh, startup companies in the U.S. in the last five years. They're going to IPO this year with, a, I think, a multi-billion dollar valuation uh, that they built literally in five years. So really incredible company. Um, what do they do? Well, they're a, uh, they're a uh, dentist-directed at-home orthodontic service, is how they would describe themselves. Uh, basically, the way it works is um, I want to improve my smile, straighten my teeth. I can go online, order an impression kit from Smile Direct Club. They'll send that to me. I take the impression at home. I send it back. Um, one of their on-staff orthodontists will, based on my uh, impressions, will put together a treatment plan, and then Smile Direct Club will send me a sequence of invisible teeth aligners over a period of time to help straighten my teeth and improve my smile. So same sort of service that one used to traditionally have to get at an orthodontist office uh, can now be done and experienced entirely in the home. Um, so you'll notice that as I describe their service, there's a whole bunch of mailed touch points that happen throughout that customer journey. So address information, as you can imagine, is very important and valuable to them. Um, so they, uh, they spend a fair amount of effort making sure that addresses are correct, both as customers enter them, but also just periodically throughout the customer life cycle, knowing that, of course, a treatment could possibly take several years uh, and making sure that they're consistently sending sending the product, which is you know, obviously a very expensive product as well, to the right location for that particular customer. Um, because it's also, in, frankly, a somewhat expensive process, um, it has a, a decent sized or decent length uh, to their sales cycle. And um, getting customers over the hump and getting customers from being interested to actually converting and subscribing to a treatment plan can take some time. So one of the things that they've done is really start to examine all of those key points within the customer journey 
and look for ways to engage in multiple channels to reach those customers to help get them over any roadblocks or, or challenges in the in the customer process. So a really good example, for, uh, for example, is uh, a customer orders an impression kit but then doesn't ultimately send back an impression. Uh, so they will, um, they will engage those customers both over email but also with a personalized postcard that gets sent to the home reminding them of the outcome of improving their smile and also offering them a discount campaign code or um, discount code to actually send in that impression kit and move forward with the process. Um, they also customize it with the location of their nearest retail store, uh, so they give customers an in-store opportunity to complete the transaction as well. Uh, so extending their campaigns into the at-home channel as well as email has helped, uh, helped them see a 30% lift in conversions from those campaigns. So really great example of a company that's built a brand experience that exists online and extends in the home uh, consistently. And I think, uh, I think Phil Burgundy Fox is another great example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they describe themselves as an e-commerce brand empowering women to celebrate themselves by curating intimate apparel based for all sizes. Uh, they were featured in Forbes uh, last time this year where the founder, uh, Leslie, was going over how the industry is notoriously lacking in diversity. So, you know, this sounds like a product that, uh, again, going back to personalization, it's not just for a certain subset of consumers. It's supposed to uh, provide a solution for you as the consumer itself. Um, and the best way to do this is not just in the product. How are they going to reflect that in their brand and in their packaging? Um, so they, they're able to create beautiful custom packaging. Each of their products comes uh, within the package. There will be a note that is essentially saying, um, you know, welcome to the club. Uh, you know, this this is curated especially for you, um, specifically for your size. Uh, you don't have to go into, uh, you know, the store and try on a bunch of different sizes to see what works best for you. Um, and their premium packaging ties in with that premium branding. Uh, customers have been sharing their unboxing experience, and that's been lead, that's led to promotions, obviously. Um, they're all over Instagram, and people love to share not only the package, uh, but the experience that the packaging contributed to um, alongside everything else that they place in there to celebrate this brand and then to celebrate what the brand represents. So to be able to contribute to that um, is a wonderful, wonderful feeling for us as a business uh, to be able to participate um, as they continue to grow um, and shine for their consumers. And then with that, I believe we're going to hand it over to some questions. We going. We're going to, uh, our last few minutes here, we're going to go through some questions. Uh, so we've got a couple that have come in. Um, anyone else who's, who's on the line, anything that sort of maybe wasn't clear, got some questions, follow up, now's a great time to throw them into the Q&A widget. And as I said, we'll get, uh, we'll get to uh, as many of them as we can. Um, but I'll just get started uh, with some of the questions we've received so far. Um, so first question here is, is what data is most uh, most important for personalization? Uh, and I think I think that's a fair question. You know, we, we talked a little bit about um, some different types of data. I think one of the most important things to think about, and as an e-commerce company, um, you know, one of the most valuable pieces of data you have about a customer, especially when it comes to retention, is um, purchase history in that you know what customers have purchased before, especially if they've made multiple purchases. And even without sort of really sophisticated affinity models, you can get a sense of what types of customers you have. Um, and you can get a sense of sort of what types of products they have. And, and even at a very loose level, sort of develop some segments out of that and tailor the messaging to those different segments. You know, at the end of the day, you're always featuring products. So finding... Um, Finding the right uh, product, right product to serve to the right customer, it is really sort of one of the key and easiest ways to do personalization. Um, so, let's see another question that came in, um, 
and I think, Phil, this one's perfect for you um, for the last example. Does Burgundy Fox put the shipping label directly on their branded packaging, or do they put their branded packaging inside a standard box that has the shipping label on it? Thank you, Amy, for uh, putting in that question. Uh, her company is Perch Birding Gifts. Um, so she does put the label on the package itself. Uh, with all the packaging that you can buy off of our website, there are shippable boxes, and you can designate an area to place your label on the package itself. Uh, you don't need to put that box inside of another box. Um, as long as the label is clearly visible, it can be on the bottom. It does not matter. Um, just as long as it's clearly placed on a box as if you would put it on an unbranded box. The only difference is this is a branded box that is displaying your design. Uh, it does not have any logistical um, consequence to place the label on that box. Um, so short answer, it goes on the branded box. Thank you for asking. Cool. No, thanks for that. Uh, let's see, another quick question. Actually, we can answer in about two seconds here. Um, asking for uh, website addresses, uh, which is a totally fair question. Um, sure. We'll actually close out with that in a second as well. But um, real simple, um, for lob, it's lob.com. And um, for ARCA, it is ARCA.com. ARCA.com. So yep. simple and easy. Um, also, if you look through the uh, resources we did that I talked about in the beginning, um, you can see those there as well. So we've got time here for just a couple more questions uh, as they come in. So uh, let's see. This is a pretty good one that we got here. How do you measure or not, as a small e-commerce company, whether you have a good brand experience? Uh, and I'll I'll take a first swag at that, but I'd be interested, you know, sort of fill in, in your thoughts as well. Uh, you know, obviously, as a smaller company, you don't have access to really detailed market research or you know, brand recall types of research as well. But you know, brand is one of those things that sort of permeates everything you do. So. You're getting, oftentimes, you're getting lift off of brand if you're getting repeat purchases. If you're getting uh, enthusiastic customers who are willing to uh, advocate on your behalf, uh, especially if you don't necessarily ask them to. Um, you know, there's, there's evidence and behavior uh, that shows through in branding, especially if they talk about your site. You know, as Phil mentioned, if they talk about your packaging uh, and show that and put that in social channels, like those can all be really good indicators. Uh, the other thing I would say to that is ask. Don't be afraid to talk to your customers and ask them specifically. You know, I've had some, some great success in my career just sitting down with customers and asking them, just kind of asking them like to personify how they experience our company or how they experience our brand. And you can learn just really Great, great insights uh, as a result of that. Uh, Phil, anything you'd add to that? 100% um, going to mirror talk to your users. That is the most important thing you can do for your business, not just for how is the, do I have a good brand? Do I, like, are they having a good experience? Just for, for everything in general, it's always great to talk to your users and they are willing to give feedback. Um, you know, put yourself in their position. If you had, a product that you that you enjoy buying and that business was all ears to hear what you had to say about it hopefully you would be excited to provide that feedback and similarly um you know we we do that here at arca where we talk to businesses that we work with and whether it's we're siloing off our top customers and doing some sort of case study and understanding what we could do better or if it's just a general survey that we you know to, to give a practical answer <laughs> Um, on an actionable item on what you can do tomorrow. Um, maybe in the checkout process provide, uh, you know, just like a simple survey of just like, how did we do? What did you like? What did you not like? Um, if you are starting from scratch and you're completely clueless about this, um, maybe you're taking on a business where there are incumbents in the space and you want to use their process as a benchmark and then what you can do to improve on that. Maybe they're the experience that they provide for consumers is fairly generic, but at the same time, it's a good scaffolding for you to use, so that you either so that you either recognize what you what you shouldn't be doing, or at minimum what you should be doing, and then you can iterate and add from there. But again, to 
um, you know, to repeat what you said, uh, when it comes to talking to your users, I think that's king. That's the most important thing you can do. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, well, I think we are at time here. Actually, we're running a little bit long. So thank you, everyone, who hung on through the Q&A. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, if you asked a question that we didn't get to, we will follow up with you offline. And of course, we will send around the uh, recording of this presentation and the slides afterwards as well. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining today. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. So